Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, okay, then they see my scrappy bit of paper. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, it's such a great pleasure for me to uh, meet with you. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I understand this is the first day back in action after the vacation. And uh, so I really appreciate that people would take the time. Um, it's my first time in, uh, in Romania. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited to finally get here. Uh, I've only known of Romania through literature, and through, through music, through arts. And to actually be here is very special. And uh, it's been quite moving also today uh, as, I, as we walk walked around the city uh, across so many places which uh, loomed so large in, in, in our lives back in 1989. And to actually visit these places, having followed the story so closely in 1989 is, is very moving. I'm also, if, I, if you'll allow, I'm a human rights guy, that's all I do. Uh, and um, to be in the country of birth of Elie Wiesel is, is very exciting. Uh, not just a champion of human rights, but one of the great, brave, singular voices of dignity and honor and integrity and courage uh, of the 20th century. Uh, and so to, uh, to come visit his home country uh, is, is, is something that matters deeply to me. Um, the purpose of my visit, uh, I am, um, my role is Director of the European Union Fundamental Rights Agency. I'll say a word first of all about the agency is and then I'll tell you what I'm doing here. Uh, the agency is the body established by the European Union to help it be respectful of human rights in its internal matters. Uh, so in other words, we only deal with the situation within the EU member states. Uh, uh, there are other parts of the system that look externally. And uh, we're an independent body of the European Union. Uh, we have a, a membership, a, a board that guides us from all the member states. And um, Professor, Professor Zladescu uh, here, of course, is the distinguished Romanian member of our management board. That's whom I've had the pleasure of working closely now for two and a half years. The, um, the, the way we carry out our work in supporting the EU, by the way, when I say the EU, I mean the European Parliament, the European Commission, and the Council of the European Union, but I also mean you, I mean the member states, uh, uh, the 28 member states, and we support all of you uh, by generating evidence on the actual situation across our uh, EU countries uh, in a comparative way. What's the experience of one group, let's say Roma here, compared to in another country? What's the specific experience of the Roma woman as opposed to the rest of Roma, the Roma child? Um, and we, um, we make sure then that this material is fed into policy making. We also, of course, uh, don't just generate data and surveys. We provide um, a hard guidance and advice based on our, our, our legal understanding, but also, very importantly, on what we learn in member states. So my colleagues, we're 150 people, and we're forever out everywhere. And you'd be surprised, my colleague Sheena here, if she told you some of the small villages she's been to in Romania uh, in doing her work. That's how we work. And then we share these practices across the membership uh, uh, to promote this way of compliance. Uh, we're, the, um, we're globally unique. There's nothing like the Fundamental Rights Agency anywhere else in the world. And uh, I think we can point to some successes and achievements. So this experiment by the European Union, uh, this invention, uh, has, I think, brought some benefit. So that then brings me to what I'm doing in Romania. Uh, this country will assume the presidency of the Council of the European Union uh, in January of next year. It will hold the presidency for six months, and it matters. It's a big deal. Uh, it's a big deal in terms of providing the political leadership for the Union for those six months. You might think only six months, it's a waste of time. Um, how can you have a sustained impact? But they're quite smart at the way in which the current, the past presidency, the current one and the future one, work as a trio. And so actually, instead of it being a six-month direction of travel, it's often, a, it's literally one and a half year when it works well. And um, so, uh, but, uh, Romania is assuming the, um, the, the presidency, which is currently held by Bulgaria, and 
I'm here to explore with the government and with the other relevant partners how we can help it in its presidency work. So um, that will range from co-organizing events on what we think are the key human rights issues uh, to feeding um, input in to the 1,001 meetings that your government will have to organize next year. And I don't joke when I say 1,001. Each ministry has shown me a list of maybe their 40 or 50 meetings. And so it's really piling up. So it's a huge project for any government. It's an enormous pressure. And we're here to see how we can support on the key issues. But I wanted to, even though that's the specific purpose of the visit, I wanted to take an opportunity to meet with, um, to meet with people uh, and share some thoughts on human rights and listen to your thoughts on human rights. And Professor Sladescu uh, and the university very kindly facilitated this afternoon's event, for which I'm most grateful. Um, let me again get to the heart of what I want to speak about this afternoon. I told you what our agency does, but maybe a, a better way to describe what we do, more impressionistic, is to say that it's our job to climb up on a hill and look out over Europe and continuously ask the question, how well is Europe doing in honouring the dignity and the, the inviolable, the precious uh, quality of the lives of all the people within its territory? in all of their richness and all of their diversity? How is it delivering for all those people? And when you put our work like that, I would have to answer you in two words, and then I'll go into many words to explain them. But my glance from the hilltop uh, rea rea causes in me a reaction, firstly, of awe, and secondly, of worry. And let me say a little bit about those two words. First, awe wonder, being impressed. Um, we have developed an astonishing system for the protection of human rights in Europe, the like of which cannot be found anywhere else on earth. And I think it's important that we start by acknowledging that before we look at the very real problems, which I will come to. But let me just talk for a moment about the, the, this wonderful achievement. Um, since let's take as a starting year, 1948, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we have put in place an astonishing system for the protection of human rights at the regional level of Europe. We see that reflected in the application for this European region of a United Nations protection system. Uh, 10, nowadays I think it's 11, 11 core human rights treaties, all of which apply for our uh, EU member states and guarantee all range of human rights, right across the spectrum. Um, we see overseeing each of those United Nations treaties, monitoring bodies uh, uh, that, that do their work in a, pretty, um, in a pretty impressive way. And in fact, I first learned about these UN monitoring bodies way back when I was secretary of something called the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And my, and my first year in that job, uh, the chair of the committee was held by a Romanian, a Ion Diakonu. I don't know if anybody knows Mr. Diakonu. Yes. And uh, so he was, uh, in a way, he introduced me uh, to protecting human rights at the level of the UN. And so when we start looking at human rights in the EU, I, I think never start, always start with the UN, because that's that first pretty impressive protective layer. But then, put on top of that yet another layer, and this is the layer of the Council of Europe, which in parallel with, and sometimes faster than the UN, have also laid on our states uh, its own guarantees and its protections. Uh, the, the Treaty Par Excellence is the European Convention on Human Rights, but that's just one of many. Uh, and uh, one that we've been talking about a lot today in meetings, uh, which some of you will have heard about, is the Istanbul Convention uh, uh, on the Prohibition of Violence Against Women, just to take uh, a very recent example. And they too, like in the UN, are guaranteed or somehow uh, uh, supported by strong monitoring bodies. And of course, in the case of the European Convention, it gives us the arguably the strongest human rights monitoring body on earth, uh, the, uh, the, the European Court of Human Rights. So that's already a second layer. And then let's add an even third layer on top of that, and that's the European Union. Um, the European Union isn't often thought of as a human rights outfit, human rights body, 
I think it's good for us to label it, label it as such. Not because it does a brilliant job, it, it has all its weaknesses, but because that's how it was originally conceived. It was conceived as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, a guarantor of values uh, which, would, um, uh, which would push back against the horrors uh, that Europe had experienced in the Second World War uh, and beforehand. And uh, the, uh, the Europe of values is powerfully captured in the, um, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is one of the most impressive human rights treaties that you'll find anywhere um, in terms of the breadth of its, um, of, its, uh, of its duties. Of course, it only applies in an area where the EU has responsibility, has what we call competence, but nevertheless, it's a very powerful instrument. And we see yet another human rights court, um, uh, very visible these days, and that is the uh, European Court of Justice. I just now spoke of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, but I would argue that the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg is no less and arguably an, an equally strong uh, court of human rights. And we may come back to that later on, uh, depending on what topics people want to raise. Um, so we have uh, we have the world's strongest transnational system for the protection of human rights uh, here in this corner of Europe within the European Union. Hey, and I didn't even mention the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, which Romania played an important part in establishing through its role, its diplomacy in the 1980s in the context of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. Um, so uh, time doesn't allow us to go there, but. That's where my awe comes from. But if I stop there, I'd be very dishonest. Uh, because I also have to talk about worries. And I'm worried. I'm worried about the delivery on all of these grand human rights commitments that have been entered into. Let me give you some examples. Um, the single problem that causes me most restlessness, sleeplessness, worry, in Europe today is a situation of our Roma brothers and sisters. I don't know if there's anybody Roma in the room today. Um, just, I just want to check. Um, we have a lot of students. Okay, okay. Students. I, 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 imagine, I imagine as much, and I don't want to speak about groups when there's somebody in the room, in the room it feels disrespectful. But let me just say that the situation is deplorable. Uh, this is Europe's largest minority. Within the EU, something like 6 million people, so significantly larger than the population of many European countries, including my own. And the, the, the indicators of deprivation, of abuse, of harassment are appalling. Just two examples on deprivation. If you are a Roma child in some EU member states, you have less access to education than a child in Sierra Leone are Burundi. Two of the poorest countries on earth, they give their kids a better chance of education than we give Roma children in some EU member states. Tonight, one in four Roma households will go to bed hungry in the EU. Now think about it. How many of you have ever been really hungry? Hunger means we couldn't get the food we needed to fill our bellies today. Uh, you know, that, not many of us go through that situation. Uh, and, and yet one in four Roma will go to bed with that experience tonight, including children. Um, so Roma, an enormous worry. Another, uh, an another worry has to do with gender-based violence. Uh, we're not the only place on earth with a problem of violence, in particular violence against women, but we've got a very serious problem, and we have to confront it uh, much more seriously. And it's a European problem. It's not this country or that country. We did a very large-scale survey before I came to the agency, but while you were there, I think, uh, already, and um, we, we, um, we were able to demonstrate that it's one, of our, it's one of our most serious social problems across the EU 28 member states. Another problem is the rights of persons with disabilities. Um, again, we have to make a major cultural shift. Uh, to recognize what's needed so that we can honor brothers and sisters of ours with disabilities as our co-equal members of our society. Uh, it's everything from issues of access uh, to issues of um, uh, living in the community. I spoke today about the difficult exercise 
uh, and in this country I know it's found challenging, to get people out of institutions into proper, respectful homes in the community. So it's a big problem in Europe. Um, the members of the LGBT community. Uh, again, we, 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 we have a problem. Despite the impression that Europe has in many ways resolved a lot of these difficulties, that's not the case anywhere. Uh, you might think that the situation of members of the LGBT community will differ dramatically from one country to the other, and certainly it does differ. But here's just one figure that will start to you. There is not one country in the European Union, not one, where a same-sex couple is comfortable to hold hands in public. That interesting, not one. Despite our notion that some countries are going way faster, others more slowly, even in the way fastest, uh, 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 we, we have uh, more than 50% uh, to be accurate, saying that they're uncomfortable uh, to, to do that. Um, let, what other, uh, well, let me leave those categories there. I just wanted to flag some categories, and there are so many more. Uh, but moving on from those categories, a, a second dimension of why I'm worried about human rights in the, in, in the EU today is because where um, human rights related bad things happen, too often the perpetrators are getting away with it. So my first example were just on where human rights are not being honored and there's huge gaps. But my second category is where um, stuff happens that everybody agrees is unacceptable, but there's impunity. I'm talking about hate speech and hate crime in particular. I'm talking about how somebody on social media or a politician uh, on a platform can say hate-filled things about vulnerable people in our society and nothing happens. And again, because of our work, we always have this helicopter view across multiple EU member states. Uh, uh, and so in many places, it's a problem. For example, we, uh, on a monthly basis, basis publish an analysis of the um, situation, the mi migration-related situation uh, in, in, in the most impacted uh, EU member states. And we see every month horrific reports of, um, of, of, of swastikas painted uh, on buildings, of um, crude anti-Islamic statements uh, on, on, on tweets, uh, of, um, un, un, uh, of, of, of deeply offensive uh, uh, things such as pig's heads being left outside places of worship. You can imagine the range of, atro of, of atrocious behavior. And in too many places, it is not investigated, it's not prosecuted, the, the perpetrators get away. A third problem, um, uh, and they're all interconnected, of course, but a third problem which concerns us greatly at the moment is the human rights impact of populist politics. Um, populism is visible in many places, and it, um, it takes similar form in many places, and its proponents are getting elected in many places. And those voices, unelected or elected, are very commonly these days uh, denying the human rights system, are denying its very foundations, denying the values that underlie it, denying the solemnity of the commitments that their states have entered into, treating human rights as a la carte. We take this bit. We we'll take that bit, but we don't like that, and we don't like that, so we'll ignore those. Uh, and again, this is not one country, it's many, uh, and it's really got to be resisted. And then the final dimension of why I'm worried, and I'm going to get to what we can do in a moment, um, but the final dimension of why I'm worried is the extent to which a cancer, uh, which eats away at the state in some of our countries, is also eating away at the capacity to protect human rights, and that's the cancer of corruption. Corruption is way bigger than human rights. It has a huge, it has dimensions well beyond the frame of what I want to say to you today. But to the extent that we do not tackle it head on and persistently uh, in our societies, then it really is a cancer, a corrosive cancer. And I've, I've worked in some of the um, most corrupt places on earth over the course of my career. And I, I, I for instance, working with the United Nations. And I have seen how corruption is the, um, is the thief that removes the capacity of the state to do its job uh, and to deny to you and to us, the people of those states, there are basic dignities, entitlements, and rights. So, in a way, I've already answered my next question because what I was planning to do, having laid out this grim 
territory was to say, well, why bother? Why should we push back against that? And of course, I've already begun to answer that question. But let me nevertheless just make a few points here. Um, why does it matter that the human rights system is under threat uh, in too many places? Uh, well, in the first place, it matters because it's about human beings. Um, it's about us. It's about you. It's about your brothers, your sisters, your parents, your grandparents. When we talk about discrimination against an older person, when we talk about people being treated abusively in an old folks nursing home, well, that's your grandmother or your grandfather. So human rights is about all of us and all of those we care for very deeply. So the basic dignity of the people involved is the first reason why we have to resist. Second reason, again I've touched on it, but let me emphasize it, is that if we don't respect human rights, we have unhealthy, we have sick societies, which will not work. Um, an example I often use is um, where we go too enthusiastically for um, strategies like combating corruption, uh, that where the strategies themselves violate human rights. Um, or we get very insistent on national security, and we put in place national security arrangements that violate human rights. Well, you know, that anti-corruption strategy, that national security strategy, they're going to fail. Because if they don't respect human rights, they're not going to get taken down. And they're not going to have the roots and the longevity uh, to deliver their outcome. So we believe human rights respectful strategies are not actually just needed because law says so, but they're actually better strategies. So six societies if we don't have respect for human rights. And you know, the third dimension is poorer societies, economically poorer societies. Take, for example, if we erode our court system. Well, that's bad, because we won't get a fair trial. But you know, it's also bad for the foreign investor who's not going to put money in the country if he or she is not convinced that they can get justice in the courtroom where a contract gets violated. And so you can also make a business case, an economic case, for respect for human rights. And again, I think that's maybe somewhat neglected. So there are some rather, um, there are some rather immediate reasons to protect human rights. And let me give you just one more, why we should push back against the weakening of our systems. And that is why they came into being in the first place. I said it already, but let me repeat myself. We have the best human rights system on earth here in this corner of Europe because we have shown the worst capacity of humans anywhere to do harm to each other. We have the system so that the appalling atrocity of the Holocaust can't happen again in Europe. We have it so that the, 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 the actions, the barbarity that we Europeans have shown to each other in our recent history, and it really is recent history. Um, uh, you know, I, I was, the Second World War was only over 15 years when I was born. That's nothing. Um, I just told you that I vividly remember your revolution. And that's what, 30 years ago now, something like that. Um, the, the, um, so, so, we, we, we have been animals towards each other in living memory on this continent. Uh, and the system is in place uh, to make sure that never happens again. And if the system is protected and nourished, it will guarantee that. But if it's whittled away, then what have we got? So what can we do? Um, a few suggestions I'd like to share with you this afternoon. Uh, the first is that our efforts, let me begin with this, before I get local, I need to start international. Our efforts to protect the system must, of necessity, be transnational. We can't do it alone. Why? First, the values that underpin human rights are universal values. The, um, it's fashionable these days to talk about European values. Well, that's, that's not bad, it's better than nothing, but I'm uncomfortable with it. Because I don't think we have values in Europe that are any better than the values held by a parent with a child in Damascus. Um, I don't think they're any better than the uh, values of a family living in Soweto in South Africa. Uh, when I go and visit such people, we have the same conversations, we have the same dreams, we have the same dignity, the same demand for respect for human dignity. Uh, and so I'd much rather talk about universal values, which we have because we're human, and those universal values which we hold dear in Europe. So when I talk about European values, that's what I mean. But we are dealing with values that transcend the nation, that, that come from the very nature of our identity as human beings. 
And so therefore we need to work in a cooperation across our frontiers to protect our rights. And also simply to learn from each other and support each other. That's very much the essence of the raison d'etre of the EU Fundamental Rights Agency. Including, by the way, if you take Romania, so that what you do right gets learned uh, elsewhere. Uh, and I already spoke today <coughs> about some good practices in Romania that we need to export so that their, their strength is shown elsewhere in Europe. But that global stuff said, or that regional indeed, said, let's get local. And in the remaining part of my remarks, I've probably already gone on a long time, in the remaining part of my remarks, I'd like to share some thoughts with you on the elements of and what's needed for the national uh, infrastructure for human rights protection, the ecosystem, or whatever you want to call it, for human rights protection. Some of you study human rights, uh, I'm sure, and uh, you, you're familiar with the textbooks. They say very little about this. They talk about what the rights are, they look at the international system. They, maybe it's changing today, but until recently, had very little to say about the delivery system uh, for human rights at the national level, which is where we all are. None of us live somewhere in a cloud. We all live in a place. So the delivery system for human rights, its health, is a matter of, of very serious concern. So I'm going to go through some elements of it. Well, the first most obvious one is the government. It goes without saying. You might think, oh, boring is what can he say that's new and interesting on that? But I have to say to you, governments find it extremely difficult to deliver for human rights. Um, you know, some very distinguished uh, uh, people in this room who, who, who have senior roles in governments, in governance, and they know what I'm talking about. Turning that principle into the policy is a giant step. It's not easy. And often when governments get it wrong, it's not deliberate. It's just the sheer complexity of the exercise. So I have a lot of sympathy for governments. Uh, in, 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 uh, in, in their delivery of their commitments. But I do feel that they need to mainstream respect for human rights more thoroughly across government. Typically, human rights tends to get parked in a bit of government. And then other bits say, nothing to do with us. So I've never, for example, had a particularly satisfactory conversation with a budget minister. Because the budget ministers typically don't think that human rights is also their responsibility. But it is, of course it is, uh, uh, for all the obvious reasons. Another dimension of governance that I'd like to mention before moving on, which is particularly important today, is local government. We see, including in time of populism and of strange national politics in many places, that it's to the cities we go to find the human rights champions. Uh, and there's a resurgence of interest by mayors and by city councils in human rights. And we have to work with these local government uh, actors to help them, to support them as they figure out what, what human rights means for my city as opposed to for the state. And this is a very exciting area of work at the present time. Moving on from government to the parliament. For too long, we've neglected, I think, the critical role that parliament plays in guaranteeing strong human rights uh, in our societies. It's not just about vetting draft legislation so that it is human rights compliant, it's certainly that. But it's also the, the less well acknowledged but critically important role of Parliament in a continuous oversight uh, through the committee systems. And uh, I'm not terribly familiar with the system here. I don't have time on this visit to visit Parliament. Uh, but uh, it is an issue that's difficult in many countries. Getting a human rights committee system in place that works and is it a silo? Because that's also the risk, you see. That's a silo. So sometimes having human rights people in a justice committee is more effective than having a human rights committee, per se, but it can work the other way around. Uh, but that is an area that is challenging. And from the point of view of my job, the EU context, uh, an added difficulty is trying to figure out when a matter that's subject, that's in a parliament, or indeed in a government, when is it or when it is not, is it not an EU matter? So-called EU competence. Some of you are experts in this, you know far more about it than me, but it's difficult. On the periphery, it's difficult. On the core, it's easy. Um, let me move from Parliament then to the third of the great institutions of state, and I have very little to say on this because it's so obvious, and that's the courts. Uh, without a strong, well-resourced, well-trained, and thoroughly independent judicial sector, we're in trouble. 
Uh, and so uh, we must be, maintain a, a continuous health check of our judiciary from this point of view. Uh, and again here, to give you a particular EU perspective, uh, we're concerned that uh, there isn't a sufficiently strong awareness within our judicial systems of the particular role of fundamental rights in an EU context. Um, so for example, we know from across the EU member states that there is not anything like enough invocation reference to the uh, European Union Charter of Fundamental Rights. It's very rare uh, that you have references to the Charter in the, um, in the work of our courts. And that's something my agency is committed to addressing through training programs and uh, working with bodies that are more specialist in training judges. So, for example, when I go back to Vienna on Wednesday, I'll open a conference of judges on the use of the Charter in national courts. Now, I'd like to turn in the second part of the infrastructure, the architecture, to bodies that get less attention and certainly are not well covered in literature. The first of those is what we call national human rights institutions. National human rights institutions is a generic title uh, to, for all of those national bodies independent of the state but publicly funded that help hold the state to account on its human rights commitments. They look very different from country to country. Here you have an ombudsman. That's a national human rights institution. My country has a national human rights commission. Um, and there's any variants, you know, all manner of variants. In France, it's the um, CNCDH, uh, the, uh, committee consult the C Consultative Committee for Human Rights. Uh, so the names are thoroughly confusing, but they, they can all be captured in this generic phrase, national human rights institution, and they are crucial for human rights. They didn't exist in large part until the 1990s, but they have blossomed since then, and they play a very important, unacknowledged role. Um, they, um, but the problem we have in the EU is that we have, in some countries, we don't have any, would you believe? We still don't have any. And in others, they're not strong enough. There are basic principles of resourcing, of independence, of mandate, uh, which, which are, are, are weaker in some countries than others. And here we, we are fortunate, we have a gold standard. We have something called the Paris Principles, a UN negotiated set of principles, which are um, which we can use to test our own bodies to see are they up to the internationally required standard. And again, an area of strong attention from my office, my agency, uh, but um, very important to protect human rights. I have a couple more, if you can bear with me. Uh, the next one I'd like to mention is uh, uh, the equality bodies. General equality bodies, which are required as a matter of uh, EU law in EU member states, and gender specific equality bodies. And they play a role which is, is, is really incalculably important. I had the privilege today of meeting with the equality body and learning about its work and its impressive record uh, uh, in terms of a heavy caseload which it processes every year despite limited resources. I was very impressed. Um, and um, it's, it, you know, that quiet work, largely behind the scenes, uh, is a real driver because these bodies have power. Uh, they, 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 have, they have formally hardwired roles in the state uh, and they make a difference. The, um, and the second, the penultimate, the second last part of the infrastructure, and I, in many ways I'm leaving what's maybe the most important to the end, um, but the, a group I want to focus on for just a few moments because it's under threat and it's so important is civil society. So I've mentioned the great institutions of state. I then talked about those publicly funded institutions that are independent of the state. And now I want to get to the people, we the people, if I may borrow the phrase. And in the first place, civil society, our NGOs, our organizations of every imaginable kind, um, including academia. This university is, 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 a, is a member of civil society. The newspapers you read are members of civil society. Those of you who worship in a church or in a faith community, that's, that's another thread of civil society. Those who stand up and shout for what is right are civil society. And right across the EU, there are problems. Uh, but before I say problems, can I say, I can't imagine us having human rights respectful societies without the role these people play. 
Uh, they are the champions, they're the awkward, difficult, demanding questioners' voices, holding uh, authority to account. And our societies would not work if they weren't doing their job, but they're increasingly impeded from doing their job uh, 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 across the EU. We uh, did a study, just published it just a few weeks ago, and we see concerns with regard to the health of civil society in four broad areas. And you can be the judges of the extent to which these raise issues for you in this country. The first is regulation. Some regulation is needed, of course, uh, but we see problems with an excessive or an inappropriate regulation in some places, uh, discriminatory. Some organizations get treated better than others, for example. Um, we, um, and it's not just regulation of which organizations can be allowed to operate, it's also what they can be allowed to do. You know, some, some, some organizations get permission to parade, others don't, um, and, and things of that nature, excuse me. But also, for the second of, my, of the four problems, regulatory is the first. The second is the problem of access. If you're out there advocating for change, you're only as good as your ability to access the decision maker, the policy maker. And if you can't get that access, uh, then you're wasting your time. And we see big problems with access. For example, an example of giving you access is public consultation. And um, we see in a number of places in Europe where the public consultation is weak, uh, or, or it's pro forma, you know, it isn't going to change anything. Or, and this is a real issue in many places, there is inadequate feedback uh, to the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, input that's been given. The third of the, fourth of the four problems that we see for civil society in many places has to do with access to money. You need funding to do your job. And we see the, the purse, the, the, the volume of money made available for human rights work is shrinking in the EU. To the extent it still exists, it's very hard to access it very burdensome procedures. And of course, we see controversies around such matters as access to foreign funding and, um, and, and access to tax-free status uh, if you're uh, dealing in, in certain sensitive areas. So, uh, and that's the third. And then finally, and I left it to last because fortunately it remains rare, and the fourth area of problem is direct tax um, on property and on places. Uh, though indeed I spoke of it already earlier when I spoke about hate speech and hate crime. Because sometimes the hate speech and hate crime is directed to NGOs who are doing unpopular actions. Uh, and that's uh, very worrying. And so the form of threat. So there you go. That's the interplay of the four problem areas for civil society. Now, if you like later, I can, there isn't much later, is there? I can come back to our recommendations on how to res resist the threat to civil society. But it is a current worry. And then finally, Finally, absolutely finally, in terms of the infrastructure to protect human rights, it's all of you, all of us, if you don't mind my saying so. Um, ultimately, we can't just rely on this organization, that organization, that paper, that party, that institution. We ultimately have to rely on ourselves. And uh, where do I get that insight from? I get it from uh, Elie Wiesel himself. Um, if there's one great single message from that man, it's about how the ordinary person has a duty to shout when he or she sees injustice, he or she, she sees inhumanity. He talked about the perils of indifference. And so I would say to all of us in this room, and I would say in any room, in any city, anywhere in Europe, I would say if we are indifferent, then the entire edifice will collapse. Uh, and, and we have to, I, we, we all have to examine ourselves constantly. And I'm making, and I'm speaking to some students here, you're not all students I know, but you ask yourself, and when you now ask yourself, am I making the life choices that demonstrate that I'm not indifferent? Uh, when, you when you take a job, is this job going to make a difference? When you change jobs, uh, is this the job that will demonstrate I'm not indifferent? And if, we, if the answer to that question, which we must ask ourselves from cradle to grave, I will keep asking myself that question every job choice I'll make in my life. And if the answer is, well, actually, that job's about money, it's not about making a difference, then I've got to walk away from that. That's wrong. Uh, and so I would say, in this strange time for Europe, uh, let's, let's, let's take this great Romanian's words and let's shout out against indifference. 
uh, and, um, and I think that way we'll succeed. And so, so friends, to wrap up, um, let me go back to what I said at the beginning. Uh, I'm here for a rather technical function to discuss with your authorities how we can support it for its presidency. There's a risk that the presidency will not be seen as a big deal, that it will be seen primarily by the people of Bucharest as the cause of multiple um, traffic jams, because that it will. Um, but it's more than that. It's a moment to bring the Romanian voice to lead Europe, to cry out against indifference. And um, I'll leave you with one last image. And again, it's another Romanian image. It's the, the astonishing sculptural work of Brancusi. I think, do you know the amazing piece, uh, Bird in Space? You've all seen reproductions of it. It's this, 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 this astonishing piece of artistic modernity of the, the shooting golden figure coming from the, the ground up into the sky. And he calls it Bird in Space. It's astonishingly beautiful, but it's also a fantastic image. Because I, I, I would like to invite you and all of us to see the Romanian presidency and our work uh, it, it, for society as being like Brancusi's Bird in Space, grounded in values, grounded in experience, grounded in all that we've accomplished, but shooting up into the sky that is the future uh, with hope and with optimism uh, to deliver something really different uh, as we go forward. So I leave it there. I, I, I thank you for your attention. I apologize for going on far too long, uh, and I'd be very happy to take any discussion that you think you would use. We thank you very much, Professor Michael of Lepi. And if you have uh, some questions, please. Please. My name is Alexandra Bufur, I'm a PhD student, and my research plan is uh, about integration and uh, the immigrants' uh, integration. Uh, so, uh, your uh, lecture was, was very interesting, and it's an honor for us to be here. Uh, my question is um, about uh, discrimination. Uh, not uh, also immigrants discrimination, but also uh, Roma's discrimination. Uh, <clears throat> because, uh, let's say, discrimination uh, is uh, not quite a problem, and immigration, from my point of view, is not a problem, but it's also a way to bring uh, human rights to the forefront, and once again to highlight um, uh, their importance. So, under the, this condition, what are you, uh, your agency priorities, priorities for the next year, uh, years to uh, minimize the effect of discrimination? Yeah. Thank you. Um, and thank you for a question that allows me to talk a little bit about the work of the agency, which I probably should do more of. Um, the, um, yes, discrimination is, 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 is a very grave concern and will continue to be a grave concern within the EU. And we as an agency are taking a number of actions. In the first place, our board has very strongly uh, expressed the need for the horizontal directive uh, in the EU, so that we can, we can deal with discrimination outside the workplace as a matter of hard EU law. Uh, this is also a firm commitment of the uh, current European Commission. It, run, it runs into difficulty with some EU member states in the Council. But that's, that's, a, that's a high priority, and if we can pull it off, then it will be, be, be transformative in terms of our ability to combat discrimination. Second, uh, one of the most important things the Fundamental Rights Agency does and must continue to do is generate the comparable data so that those who combat discrimination can work with the actual situation in reality. And this is what I hear time and time again from, um, from equality bodies. They say, we need the evidence, we need the hard statistical data on the experience of this group, on the experience of that group, and then we can, we can work with that. Um, the challenge there, we will continue as an agency to do surveys, to gather the hard data in some areas, but not all, 
But what we need to do is work with national, and this is an important priority of ours in the coming years, work with national data gatherers, such as national statistical agencies, to gather the data to do the assessment of, of discrimination. So in terms of narrowly on discrimination, they would be our priorities. But let me just say, uh, uh, combating discrimination is hardwired uh, to a core activity of our agency, and that's not going to change. Thank you, and um, my name is Andre Corai. I'm a PhD student of uh, Madame Zlatay School. I want to thank you for the, the great speech, and uh, I wanted to ask you, in the light of what you have said, uh, and in the light that for European Union and for Europe, human, defending human rights is the crown jewel, um, how did you found our authorities? prepared for the semester that will come? Thank you. Um, well, in the first place, of course, my meetings were, were private ones, and it would be really inappropriate if I shared with you what was exchanged. But I can make you some certainly very honest general observations. Uh, I've, I've encountered ministries that are planning very seriously. Uh, and um, I do a visit like this to all member states in preparation for presidencies. And the level of preparation at this time is, is good. It's impressive compared to the situation I've encountered in one or two other locations. Um, so I'm looking forward to a really solid cooperation with your government. Hi. Hello. My name is Sergio Bursaru. I'm just a poor student from a master. Um, I have a very, very uh, focused question. Uh, Professor Clarapi. Probably you all agree that the word could be uh, the strongest weapon if you know how to handle it. The word. Word. Yeah. The word. Yeah. The word. Uh, if I have something against your ideas, probably I try to fight with words to write something, articles, John. Is it okay? It's okay. Um, <laughs> respect me these ideas. Respect me these ideas. Do you have, because I really don't know, do you have is a European European Union, do you have um, a very clear legal definition for hate speech, hate crime? Because I must know how to write. Yeah. What is the limit? Yeah. Because, for example, let's if I'm a journalist and I have to fight against your idea, it's just an example, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I have to know how strong should be my word. Yes, sure. Do we have this kind of definition, very clear and legal definition of case speaking? Uh, the answer is more or less. Um, what I mean by that is uh, we do have definitions. We have definitions in the relevant um, uh, EU directive. And we have definitions in the United Nations law, for example, uh, on when speech crosses the line. And there are some tests that are in play. It has to, it has to be insightful of um, violence or discrimination uh, on the grounds of certain categories like religion, race, ethnicity. And if it doesn't meet those tests, then it, 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 it doesn't constitute hate speech. Um, the, um, Making the assessment at any given moment is, is for sure difficult. But you know, in the extreme, it's not difficult. When somebody says um, uh, that group are cockroaches to be exterminated uh, and uses a radio program, Radio Mil Colin in Rwanda, you know, you know remember that? That's, um, that's, there's no doubt, there's no doubt there. But when somebody expresses a view that they don't like a policy, uh, then it's a very different matter. So um, it, it, one of the challenges is to distinguish between rude speech, which must be allowed, and hate speech, which must be uh, prohibited. So I'm not, I'm not giving you a, uh, I don't want to give you some kind of a tidy answer because there isn't one, and it's going to require, it requires ongoing attention. It's one of the big issues on taking down speech online at the moment. Uh, uh, where does it? Where, where is it legitimate and where does it cross, or where is it excessively enthusiastic? Um, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. So how can you judge? 
But that's what I said. Every, I, in every instance, on a case-by-case -case basis, but not through some general observations. Uh, and one of the things the Americans have taught us in their jurisprudence, in their legal practice, is um, the danger of prior restraint in terms of prohibiting speech by category in advance. Because that's, that's a very... We don't like that in Europe. It's too broad, it's too... Um, uh, it, it, well, I mean, we, we... Rather, let me put it in this way. The Americans don't like it, and they've been very clear on it. But I think we increasingly in Europe also see a similar approach. You can't ban paper. You can, you can, you can prosecute an article. Things of that nature. I know it's not good, actually, but it's best. Other questions? There is a follow up question now. A big problem in the uh, European Union are the fake news. Yeah. How we can handle this topic? Because fake news arise, populism grow, yeah. and it affects the good delivery of sure. human rights. Yeah. We have the right to be informed, but yeah. the information is. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah so many dimensions to the answer to your question. Um, there really are quite distinct elements, and like all very complex issues, it's necessary to unpack its complexity and find specific solutions to specific dimensions. I'll give you a few. A big part of the problem of fake news is the capacity of social media to multiply it and to send it where, it, it, where they think it should go. Uh, so it, 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 it's not just a fact of it being a piece of fake news. It's no accident it goes to certain social media accounts and not others. It's no accident that certain words are used and not others. That in large part is based on algorithms and artificial intelligence. And so our agency is researching at the moment uh, fundamental rights and algorithms and artificial intelligence with a view to seeing how that territory can be your pardon, how it can be policed, if you will. Um, a second dimension is the uh, self-regulatory role of the uh, media platforms. And that's what's being discussed right now. Uh, you've seen Zuckerberg in the, um, in the US um, uh, 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 um, uh, House of Representatives and Senate over the last few days. And that's in large part about what is the role of the platforms themselves to, to take down what is identified to be fake. Um, and again, I don't want to be too absolute there. It's just that's another dimension. A third dimension, which we do vigorously at our agency, but we don't do enough of because we're too small, is confront fake news with true news. Um, we've done this quite a few times recently. Um, I, uh, for example, this is already two years old, but it's a good example. You remember about two years ago, at New Year, a, a story went viral that... Um, that um, immigrant young men were raping women in Cologne, in Germany. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it was, a, it was a fact. Nobody's denying it happened. But it's the twist in the story then. Because was the twist... it big news in the Europe? Uh... Yes, it was. It yeah. was. That's right. But the twist in the story was, ah, these migrants are bringing sexual violence to Europe. That's the fake bit. And what we did was, we, we relaunched, literally, uh, our Violence Against Women survey results of a year earlier, which showed that, yes, we've got a really serious problem, but it's our own problem. Don't blame the migrants. And, uh, you know, so that's something we do. And we do it repeatedly, wherever we can. Um, and, um, and that's another dimension. Um, uh, and, and then there's an external dimension, which I can't talk about, because it's totally outside the mandate of our agency which is that a lot of fake news doesn't originate within the European Union. It originates elsewhere, and we all know where. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I'm going to leave that to others to talk about it. So let's not be overwhelmed by the scale of the problem. Deconstruct it into its elements and tackle each one of those one by one, and we'll get on top of this. Other questions? We thank you very much, Professor. Michael of Berlin for uh, this uh, human rights afternoon. And uh, we wish you again in our university, in, in our country, with uh, conferences for, uh, for some uh, professional or non-professional meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much.